Peace and power. It's your girl, the Network Junkie, which is going to always keep you updated to the latest what's happening. What's happening right now is I got Mama D on the line, and she's going to be talking to us about the importance of generating black dollars. She is also, she has a family business, and they actually have an organization called Liberated Farms that we'll be talking about today. So make sure you tune in and get this good here work. Right now, I have Mama D on the line. I'm going to ask her a couple questions, and don't hesitate to get active in the comments if you have any questions and concerns as well. Don't forget to grab your notepads and pens because this is about to get ready to drop some jewels. So let's go ahead and get into it. Hey, Mama D. Peace. How are you? I am well. How are you today? I'm excellent. I cannot complain. Awesome. Now, the reason why I reached out as well is because I see you as a superhero in our community. I have witnessed a lot of different trials and tribulations that you had to go through with your business, Liberated Firms. Um, and I'd like you to just touch on a few things that you have went through. Also, share the demographics, what services you provide, and anything else you feel like we would need to touch on. But first, we're going to start off with give the people a little information about Liberated Farms. So Liberated Farms is a urban farm initiative that my husband and I co-founded in 2016. We actually just started with a small plot of land that we didn't own. It was in a public park that had been abandoned for, I want to say, 15 or so years. It, uh, it used to be an area that he used to play in when he was younger, and his mother actually worked for Parks and Recreation, and she cared for that land. After she retired, the city never had anyone come and, I guess, take over her area. And it just got worse and worse over the years. Um, in his adulthood, he wanted to do something for his community. And then he decided to turn that old park into a, a community garden space. And that's that's basically that was where we started. A small little plot of land with some cinder blocks in the middle of a, a, a lighted park. <laughs> Wow. Wow. And I am so delighted to have actually um, had the opportunity to work over there with you and to see some of the things that, that the community was doing was definitely enlightful. Uh, my children was excited to participate with you guys as well. And I noticed when you when you guys did take over that land, we're trying to reach, you know, bring it back for the community to take advantage of and to be able to eat off of. You was having some disagreements with some of the neighbors. Would you like to speak more about that as well? Uh, there was a European woman who purchased a home that was across the street from, that was across the street from the land that we, uh, that we were tending to. Mm -hmm. That wasn't so happy about the presence, correct? I apologize. I had to press play for my son. <laughs> um, Sorry. There was a uh, European woman who purchased a home that was across the street from the park that we were tending. Uh, she had her own plan for the area. And the plans that she had did not include having a community garden in the way that we were doing it right there. And that bothered her. And in that bothering her, she took matters into her own hands and continuously called the police on my spouse. So anytime that he went to the public park, which was across the street from her home, she called the police and she ended up saying that he was stalking her. Um, we were unaware at the time, but stalking basically is anyone that can see you and have a fear for their lives or their safety regardless of what you were doing. If they see you and you are in your presence uh, enough times, that's considered stalking. So him being across the street in the park tending to the land, um, she was able to pull up top stalking charges on him and he ended up getting a warrant out for his arrest for stalking her and two of the neighbors that stayed next door. Oh, wow. I didn't even know that was a thing. Yeah, uh, traditionally, when we think about stalking, um, we think someone's breaking into your house, someone's following you around, someone's looking in your windows, but to, 
the way that the law is written, if uh, someone is walking across the street from your home every single day, whether they're going to the store or to the bus stop, and they make you feel uncomfortable, that can be considered stalking if it makes you uncomfortable. So it's uh, it's based on, you know, I guess, personal characteristics of how you feel when you see someone, I guess. And uh, we were just unaware, and it's so important to be um, aware of how these laws are written so that we understand things like that because that's not what we, that's just not what I attribute stalking to. Exactly. That's not when you first think stalking. That's definitely not what you think. You really feel like, okay, well, I feel like I'm in danger. This person is harassing, or like you said, peeking through the window, or always coming around trying to make you uncomfortable in some type of way. But we understand, overstand how sometimes the laws is written not really in plain content. <laughs> you know, things that make sense is always not the greatest of making sense when it comes to some of these laws that's um, written. But moving forward, um how did that experience end up um creating the space that you're in right now so in that we ended up uh having to go to court there was a physical two-day court date jurors everything judge jury lawyers like it it turned into a whole thing where he could have gotten two years of prison time um, for stalking these women when in reality he was gardening um They caught the situation, uh, we, the, it, it ended up being called gardening while black. Mm. And um, a long story short, the judge threw the case out after a two day trial of talking to the women who said they were being stalked because the women had no proof or no, there, there was nothing there. Anytime they asked them a question about the situation and they always said oh we walked over to him in the park Mm. I I left my home because I seen him in the park and I crossed the street and I went to him and did or said this so every time they left the safety of their home Mm -hmm. and went to something that they thought made them unsafe in a public park that wasn't bothering them or thinking about them and they you know they bothered him really they were stalking and harassing him that part that's what I was going to say. Did the, did, the, did the tables turn? Did they get prosecuted? They did not. Nothing. Mm. Absolutely nothing happened uh, so far. That Nothing's happened. Uh, we have been thinking about reopening the um, case. If we can find some help with that, the you know, legal things are not. Mm. They're not a uh, forte. <laughs> not, not our forte. But our forte is tending the land and community advocacy. So we took that situation and we actually purchased land with the help of the uh, Detroit Black Farmer Land Fund. Okay. Uh, It is a grant that comes up every year on Juneteenth. If you are a farmer, if you tend the land, if you have a garden, if you are interested in anything agricultural, you are already doing it. Every year on Juneteenth, the Detroit Black Farmer Land Fund has a grant where they will buy the land for you. Ooh. Again, for those in the back. One more time. That's the Detroit Black Farmer Land Fund. They will buy the land for you to continue doing the work that you are doing. It is a grant. You just applied. And if you are not aware, a grant means that it is basically uh, it's a gift. It is a gift. And that, that's how we that's how we perceived it. It's a gift. You helped us get land in an area where we were having issues, um, racial disparities, really, in an area where he grew up. And um. we were trying to do wonderful things. And in that, we had to deal with overt racism. racism. And they helped us get our first two plots of land. Oh, yes, yes. Um, since then, we have purchased more land, and we have collectively worked with other farmers mm-hmm. who are interested in doing the same work. We are all individual farms, but we work collectively and pool resources collectively, and we are building in the same general area. Right now, there are four different farmer 
four different farmers with four completely different projects, but we all work together to pool our resources and build up that community in that area. We are all black. We all own our land. We all build on our land. We all revitalize that neighborhood and speak to our neighbors, get to know the people that are there and deal with the people that are in that area. But once again, Detroit Black Farmer Land Fund, that's what you want to do. Uh, Juneteenth, every year, you just fill out that application, give them the information they need, and they will help you through the process. That is amazing. Thank you for sharing. This has been an awesome experience. I appreciate you for allowing us to just tap into your business, your brand, your family, you know, and your experience has definitely encouraged, inspired many. And I'm hoping that this message will do the same. And um, guys, make sure y'all take down that information. Um, and look into it, like you said, like she was just saying, if you have a farm, if you have a land, a piece of land that you are um, tending to with uh, a garden and you need a little assistance, just reach out for that help. Like she said, it's a grant is somewhat just like a gift, you know, so as long as you have something to be able to give, um, they're willing to assist. So again, sis, I appreciate you for sharing that. How can the people find mm -hmm about how they can participate in your actual projects? So all of our information can be found at Liberated Farms. Um, that's Liberated with an E-D, L-I-B-E-R-A-T-E-D, Farms. Um, we are Liberated Farms on Facebook, Instagram, as well as uh, our website is just liberatedfarms.com. There you can find out about our programs. We have an annual youth farmer agricultural apprenticeship program mm. we have youth come we only accept between 10 and 15 depending on how much funding we can uh save up we are grassroots we are not a nonprofit. we are not an llc we are grassroots and pay for everything out of pocket so depending on how much money that we get saved up we pay the youth to come and learn Ooh. how to tend land how to farm um, house, water catchment systems. We have other um, farmers come out and do, um, what is it called, workshops with them. We go to other farms as field trips to learn from those farms. Uh, there's a farm around the corner from us, um, well, I can't remember the name, but it is on Durden Street, and they, we, we uh, like I said, in that area, we partner with a lot of farms, and we all pull a lot of resources and work together with the youth. Um, it is usually from April until October, and the children get paid monthly, and they get the, we serve lunch as well, and they just get the opportunity to get that hands-on experience, mm -hmm. the, you know, the, the ins and outs of urban sustainability and building from the land, because traditional farming is slightly different from urban farming. We have different uh issues that we have to overcome like water sourcing and pollution that in traditional farming areas that they do not as well as uh you know just different types of animals and things that we have to deal with in urban settings mm. but uh we also have the pyramid builder steam camp um, STEAM is science, technology, engineering, arts, agriculture, and math. In that program, we usually teach the children coding. Um, we actually just got donated a 3D printer, and we are in the process of learning the ins and outs of that, so we can start teaching the youth how to uh, work with the 3D printer because coding and coding is the future. <gasps> yes, yes. STEM in general is the future, but coding, that's, that's every app that you use, every program that you use, every every picture that you take, your Facebook, your TikTok, your, every, your Snapchat, everything broken down to its basic science. It's just simple coding. You can make your own apps. You can make your own programs. We don't have to use the ones that are out there, which also have many racial disparities against us. You can make your own. At least be using the apps that you want to make. And they should do what you want them to do. And you shouldn't have to conform to the apps where they can shut your business down just because they don't want it to be seen. We want you, we want the youth to learn coding so they can take control of their own futures and have control over the way that their businesses are put out there. So that, that's, that's something that's very important to us as well. Facts. That is amazing. Again, being able to teach how to be sustainable in today's era is 
a blessing. And again, I thank you for all of your works. I thank your husband and the team that you guys have formed as well. I'm just here to share the message that superheroes still do exist. <laughs> yes, yes, and I greatly appreciate you for sharing this powerful message. I'm going to make sure that it reached the masses. And um, do you have anything in closing? I just want to talk about building building a community. You can't do it by yourself. You Thanks. can't do it by yourself. You need a village. And we are not doing this by ourselves. Even with the collective that we are building with, the four or five farmers that we are building with, it's not just us. We work with the elders in our community. We work with the youth in our community. We like to be well-rounded. We, you know, I work specifically with uh, Mama Shu. Mama Shu is amazing. Mama Shu is inspirational. We work uh, specifically with Bobby Yusuf at the Mama Kua house. Mm -hmm. Bobby Yusuf also amazing, inspirational. These people, there are so many people. Uh, Cape Line Village, there are so mm -hmm. many people, organizations, nonprofits out here doing the work. Find the one that aligns with you. When you start doing your work, it aligns you with your tribe. And once you are aligned with your tribe, that's when all the magic happens. You just got to figure out, find what you want to do and start doing it and let it align it and, and follow that and trust your intuition. And that's when you really start building that magic so we can create that generational wealth that we're always talking about. And generational wealth usually doesn't come down to dollars. Generational wealth comes down to what you have behind the money. Do you have, do you own homes? Do you own your businesses? Do you have your trust set up? Do you have money in? Can you feed yourself? There's a quote that says, uh, one second, what's the quote? Oh, I cannot remember the quote. Now I apologize, but it's something like to uh, to feed the people is to control the people or who feeds you controls you or something like that. We have to start taking more control of what we're doing and what we're consuming. Mm -hmm. these, uh, these farming practices that they have right now, they're not healthy. These, these different GMOs that they're using, the way that they're processing these animals, and a lot of the chemicals that they're using in these foods are detrimental to our health. They're completely different than what you'll get when you step into a community garden and, you know, taste something. I just taught a workshop with some kids last Tuesday, actually, where we did chlorophyll extraction uh, experiments with ages three to seven years old. Ooh. And I had the youth taste liquid chlorophyll um and they looked at me like i was insane because they don't you want me to try that and i'm like yes i do i want you to try it just try it a little bit let me know what you think and i say every single baby in that classroom there's only eight of them but all eight of them kept asking for more chlorophyll water they wanted more and more and more chlorophyll water because they loved it but it, it's not something they would have traditionally done and they're mm -hmm. like well, that but it's natural we said we have to get back in touch with nature and back in nature and being in nature for us as, as black people is rebuilding that village that village is a part of our natural element we are one with the village Reese back thank you again for coming to encourage inspire the importance of taking business and and community and making it make sense also an overstanding to not give up when you make a plan make sure that you take the steps that is needed to enforce and also um don't let anyone um intimidate you because it was so easy i'm pretty sure it was individuals like hey just go ahead plea out don't even worry about it you know let them have they land let they have them space and all of that if you guys would not have staged your ten toes down on what was right you would not be in a position that you're in now because it, what it did was it pushed you guys to learn more and to also make sure that your grounding was really grounded and again i'm appreciative and um want to make sure that we give accolades to the works that you have done and the continued works that you and your collective is done doing right now and we encourage everybody to just chime in to all of the information that was shared um and go look at liberated farms again on you say instagram and facebook yes okay do you have a website at all www.liberatedfarms.com y'all got the memo and until next time me and mama d is out peace and power Peace.